Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webcast. I'm Anne from Standout Earth, and you're in the right place for where digital and physical security meet, what activists need to do about surveillance, doxing, tracking, and more. Thank you so much for being here, and special thanks to all of our presenters for their time getting ready today and, and sharing their knowledge with us today. We're so happy to have you all here. I'm um, going to just run through a couple of um, structure things for everybody, and then I will introduce uh, Pr Praveen Sinha, one of our speakers, and he will introduce um, all of his co-panelists, and then we will begin um, with the presentations. And I would like to introduce uh, Praveen Sinha, who um, is one of our panelists today. And Praveen is the Director of Technology at Equality Labs. He has a background in software engineering, STEM education in marginalized communities, community organizing, and activism in issues surrounding state violence. And um, Praveen was recommended to me um, to do um, some training for us on digital security by um, a member of our activist network. And um, we're so happy for that recommendation and to have him here and um, also to have all of um, these panelists who, who he brought together for us today. And so extra thanks to uh, Praveen. Um, and with that, I'm going to let him take it away. Thanks, Anne. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this panel of uh, folks uh, that we're going to go into is just uh, pretty, very really illustrious. Uh, everyone has been working at the forefront of uh, digital security, of law, of uh, just working with marginalized communities, uh, and uh, I'm really excited to to have everyone. Uh, and with that, I'm actually just going to do another introduction for uh, just our first set of uh, speakers here. So I'm just going to uh, intro uh, Idaline uh, Bobe, who's been working uh, at uh, TechActivist.org. Idaline Bobe is a political educator and technologist, <laughs> and she's worked at uh, the global, uh, global Social Justice Lead at ThoughtWorks and is a founding partner and former community uh, manager of Black Girls Code, so that's really awesome. Uh, and with her is going to be Alexa Hancock. Alexis is a security advocate at techactivist.org, uh, and she's a passionate digital humanist and Black feminist, and uh, she often searches uh, for solutions through her first love, which is technology. Oh, their first love. I'm so sorry if, uh, if I got the pronouns wrong. I apologize. Uh, and then Alexis has a background in web development, community organizing, racial economic disparity research, and education media. Hey, everyone. Y'all can hear me? Thumbs up? Cool. Awesome. So thank you, Praveen, for introducing me. Thank you all for having me. My name, again, is Idaline. I work with an organization called techactivist.org. It's a grassroots organization that really started around 2014 out in Ferguson when I was doing some community work um, with different organizations out in Ferguson, um, trying to help them to really just use web as a way to put what was happening on the ground up so everyone could see it. Um, never did I imagine that two weeks while I was on the ground, 200 um, FBI agents would then be sent to Ferguson to further um, work with uh, Sorrell and do a lot of interesting things to the people on the ground. So that's kind of where techactivist.org got its roots from, was like, whoa, well, if we have unarmed communities being surveilled, and then 200 FBI agents coming to the scene, um, what are we up against? And how can we use tech to secure, um, or to better secure what we're doing and to advance the work that we're doing? And that's kind of, again, like I said, how we got started. Another reason why techactivists.org got started was because we're living in a world where people don't believe we can bring change in the world. We believe that we can die for a movement, but do we really believe that we will see the change that we want to see? Not so much. People are more kind of like feeling helpless and hopeless and that's because for so long, the people who have the knowledge and the tools to do something about the issues in the world being exploitation, racism, sexism, um, 
and all these other issues, they didn't do anything. They just continued to create extreme poverty and desperate times. So techactivist.org is something that we wanted to, to be a light while we're in this movement. It was actually inspired by the Black Panther Party. And an interesting fact is 45 years ago, the Black Panther Party included the right to learn, access, and control technology as a right in their 10-point program. And it's called Community Control of Modern Technology, which is our hashtag. Um, Huey said, knowing how to struggle is the essence of winning. Recognizing ills is fundamental. Rec recognizing how to overcome ills is mandatory. And that is why we believe it's critical for our people to understand the role technology plays in our society and in the economy. If we want to win, we need to know what we're up against. You're not gonna go into a fight and prepare a fight and think you're going to be fighting against a teddy bear. Then you're fighting against a grizzly bear. You know, you'll come to the fight very differently if you know what you're up against. And that's kind of, what techactivist.org is hoping that we do, that we're hoping that we can prepare our community to win because we're fighting for our liberation, we're fighting for our lives. Um, and it's really interesting because a lot, you know, you see tech and you think tech is our friend. We trust apps so much that Google knows us more than our mama knows us, you know, like it knows what time we got to get up and notifies us when we got to leave the house, make it to our next meeting on time. Um, when we're typing in the search engine, um, what we want to look up, it finishes our sentences. And we think tech is this cute little thing that keeps all of our data in the cloud without really knowing that it's tracking our daily movements is tracking our daily lives and it's not in a cute little cloud it's in a cold basement um, and it's being surveilled um, and there's so much more information that we need to know in order to prepare ourselves to know that silicon valley is not a friend to ours even though it has a lot of pr reps making media um you know messages to stand in solidarity sometimes with us, it is not our friend. The CIA and the NSA were awarded in 2015 $52.6 billion in funding for non-military intelligence. A lot of people don't know that a lot of tech and our communication devices really did get started by the government, such as the internet. The internet was only created when during one of the war, wars, um, the US got really scared, like, oh, well, if we get bombed, how are we going to communicate? So they created the internet. Um, and many of our apps have seed funding coming from the government. And that's why they're able to easily surveil us to turn on our microphones or our video cameras, even when we didn't give them permission to. So tech activists likes to just kind of provoke really thoughtful conversations by bringing in elders such as Sister Elaine Brown, former chairperson of the Black Panther Party, um, and having her talk about what is state violence because surveillance is because of the state violence. Um, and what is the roots to state violence and having that amazing Black political thought, radical thought to bring in so much history really helps us to prepare and to create a strong strategy for today. And then as we're talking about strategy, we get to techactivist.org explores different apps or tools, tech tools that we're using today that people may, people as an activist may not know about. Um, so we bring on amazing people like Alexis Hancock, who is the security advocate at techactivist.org to talk about Signal, to talk about Thunderbird and different tools such as she will explain more when she goes on. We only have a couple of minutes to kind of talk today, but definitely hit us up anytime. And there's a little chat box um, for you if you see in the bottom of your screen that you can send us messages on any question as we're talking. So at the end, we can answer that. 
So I'm going to just move forward and have um, Alexis kind of talk more about encryption and different things. Thank you. Thank you, Edeline. Um, can everyone hear me well? Yes, you sound great, Alexis. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. So as Edeline said, that I would talk more on encryption and more on, I guess, having more hold of your data and what tools to use while you have all this data within, mostly in the smartphone realm, but it can also cross over into your devices such as laptops and personal home computers, desktops at home. But mainly I'll be speaking to um, smartphones themselves. So Edeline brought up a good point about Google and all these other companies that we sort of use every day and feed data into. So one of the first things I want to talk about is encryption. So encryption um, can be a vague world. <laughs> and usually when people talk about encryption, they're talking about, you know, concealing. So I want to talk about that main point where encryption, it doesn't necessarily stop interference of your data moving or stop interference of someone trying to access your data. But what it does do, what it does do is conceal your data from being human readable. And that's the whole point of encryption, no matter you know what you study within it, what algorithms you know, don't know, that's the main point of encryption. So encryption can come in many ways and many forms and also access to your data can come in many ways and forms. So Eileen brought up Google and how kind of, you know, it knows so much about us um, because we sort of came into this point of time with technology where everything's being streamlined together, especially within our smartphones, um, with, you know, our credit card data, payment data, data, um, our social media is being integrated with other platforms. A lot of data has become streamlined these days. And the danger with that is now only a few hold the main process of our data. So they, they hold the main infrastructure and data in the database, like a centralized form of what does, you know, for instance, me, Alexis, have like she has these many credit cards she has these many gmail accounts she, there's so many things that are not split up anymore and they're streamlined so in terms of encryption and using on your phones like texting uh Eileen mentioned signal signal is a very good tool there are other encryption tools out there in terms of texting encrypting your um, text messages um, on a one-to-one -one basis and i say one-to-one -one basis because uh, without having encrypted messaging what normally happens is traffic on cell towers can be read and viewed. Uh, police officers and other law enforcement have used other devices to kind of sniff traffic um, on cell phone towers, uh, like in Ferguson or any other um, protest around um, anti-establishment protests where they use something called stingrays. Um, and they say back and forth whether or not they use them or not, they have been proven to be in use. So having encrypted traffic um, going out to your phone and, and going to someone else is very important. Signal is an application I believe is available on Android and iOS. Um, also, aside from traffic and what data you put out there into the world, it's also um, good to know about things called like two-factor authentication. When it Because we talk about a lot of, um, we're really excited about availability of data, right? And that was the whole point of Google. That was the whole point of Facebook. That was the whole point of all these integrations was this availability. But there are two other facets of security called confidence and integrity. So confidence and integrity has been heavily eroded over the years. And we can see that now with the news with Facebook. And But Facebook is just the surface. So a lot of companies have been using each other's data to streamline profiles and to um, buy data from each other. Data is currency. Um, it's no longer about whether or not, you know, how much money they can make, how much exploitation they can make, um, and how much, you know, exploitation can profit. So other phones and like Android, Google has a lot of permission, loose permissions, Android has a lot of loose permissions. So what we can do on your personal phone is encrypt your phone. So if you go into your security settings in your Android particular, I'm focusing on Android because it's more open source and less proprietary than Apple, but I'll get to Apple in a second. Um, Android, they have an encryption feature on your phone. So that's another thing with actual smartphones themselves. We've now come into a process in time where, you know, people are now leasing $600 to $1,000 phones where you used to just be able to buy a phone or receive a phone for free. 
some something of that nature where you're able to actually afford a phone and own it. Um, now manufacturers like Apple and phone service providers are coming together to almost take away that ownership of these phones. And now what happens to that data now? It hasn't gotten to that point where they say, okay, you don't own this phone, you don't own this data, but it's creeping there. So over, the, over that point in time where you have a leased phone, um, a lot of people are, are tossing out phones each year now, um, a lot of e-waste because, sorry, because of it. So when you have something like that, going on with these phones, you need to know how to dispose properly. So encrypting your phone and then being able to reset the factory data before you give your phone back is something you're able to do now. But now that people are leasing phones, what, what, who's to say that these manufacturers and phone companies won't say, oh, we'll take care of that for you, don't worry about it. That can get into a dangerous slippery slope, but I'll refocus on what you can do for now. And encrypting your hardware on your phone or encrypting the data on your phone is very important. Um, having two-factor authentication, like different, um, if, if services provide it, Google provides it, Facebook provides it, um, and other services as well normally provide two-factor authentication where you need more than just a password to log in. That's what I mean by 2FA. Um, also, um, I'll post a link here in the chat of different tools that I won't be able to necessarily cover. Um, I'll post it here. Um, tacticaltech.org has many toolkits and many um, links and resources overall that you can use to be able to um, navigate what type of phone you have. So they go over iOS, they go over Android and other devices you may have. Tor browser is a good um, browser that they have out there where, oh, I see a, cute, a question here. Um, but overall, being able to encrypt things, being able to um, use different tools, they list that there. Um, if you have more analog phones, because a lot of, I know a lot of activists may not necessarily invest in the latest smartphone or may have a phone on the side that they necessarily use just for their um, activist use. What normally happens when you have more analog based phones that are not typically smartphones, uh, overall, you can have, you know, I guess a more, uh, your cell, if your cell phone is not smartphone based, it's less associated with your profile. So you can take um, investment and um, you can take solace in that where you know this number itself, you can keep protected. But now that you, a lot of people have smartphones um, and being able to use it out every year and throw it away every year, um, overall, what you need to do is just kind of take into inventory of what you have and what you don't have and who you're contacting, who you're not contacting. And awareness is very important. I think overall with owning a smartphone. Um, capitalism, uh, I don't want to get into too much of a soapbox about it, but capitalism itself is a security vulnerability. I've been saying that for a long time. Um, we've seen it now with a lot of companies using um, greed as a factor to use our data and being able to um, make profiles based on us and make money off of us. But overall, um, capitalism, it creates a constant change of hands. So manufacturers being able to fix your phone um, is becoming an issue. So we saw like with net neutrality, how ISPs can necessarily sniff your traffic and your data over the internet, but a lesser um, covered, I guess, issue is being able to fix your phones yourself. Um, the right to repair is becoming a big issue. Modular phones do exist where you can take phones and be able to use out parts and will be more environmentally friendly. It's called Fairphone, it's out in Europe. I'll post that link as well. As well. Um, but Fairphone is not available in the U.S., unfortunately. But Google and Apple are ignoring this technology and saying that this technology is not possible. If so, then how come it already exists? So being able to say, like, oh, you can't have anything else but a whole new smartphone is not, um, is not true, straight and simple. So overall, being able to take inventory of what you have. Um, I'll post another link here. Um, a good um, factor for choosing a new phone, um, especially in terms of being able to handle it yourself, would be going to places like ifixit.com in terms of, and a good question, I would say a metric for getting a new phone is how am I able to replace the battery? How easy it is to replace the battery is a very good question. 
because it starts to go into the um, rabbit hole of what kind of manufacturer you have in your phone. Will the company let you replace the battery easily? Do they charge an insane fee um, or a really wild fee in order to actually replace this? It becomes um, a good question to kind of branch out and talk about your data and talk about who owns it and who owns your phone um, and talk about overall um, how capitalism plays a huge part in this. So encryption, um, two-factor authentication, um, tools like Signal, browsers like Tor, um, Keybase is another, uh, I guess, pseudo social media type app that's also using encryption. Um, mostly these uh, tools can, are based off something called pretty good security, PGP. Um, so having PGP keys is a little harder to explain. Um, off brief, but overall, I'll post those links as well um, uh, to talk more about PGP and pretty good security keys where encrypted traffic is based mostly on that um, tool set. So overall, those are the things where you can do a turn about encryption. If you go for Android, someone asked about Android. Um, if you go into your security settings on um, and go into settings, you'll see something about security. And it normally takes about an hour to actually um, encrypt your phone to make sure it's charged or on the charger um, while you encrypt your phone, because normally it takes a little while to process all that data and truly encrypt it. So when you go through that encryption process, make sure you have time and sit down with the phone and be able to actually let the phone do its thing. So overall, um, having other um, alternative tools while you browse. Uh, I use DuckDuckGo for search. I've gotten away from the lexicon of using saying Google it. I don't say Google it anymore. I say search it. Because there's other search um, engines out there like DuckDuckGo who don't store your search data for more profit and more availability to what you're searching um, for the most part right now. So um, I say go to tacticaltech.org because they list all those tools. Um, there's so many I could list, but those are the main ones that I know I use. I also use VPN for my traffic going outwards um, uh, for data at in um, transit. It's another facet of security. So using a VPN over public Wi-Fi, um, I suggest don't use public Wi-Fi at all um, just because I don't trust it at all. But overall, I could talk about this all day, but I'll go um, and I'll hand it over very soon. But overall, um, having a VPN or um, virtual private network for your Wi-Fi is very important. And in places where you can't or in, in other things you can do that are very simple is if your device is not in use and you're going to sleep, turn data off, turn Wi-Fi off. It turns all the network connection off to your phone. Um, I turn off my Wi-Fi every time I close my laptop. Um, I take out the Ethernet cord. I do whatever I need to do. If I don't need access to the device, I cut off access to the device overall on the network. So there's very little things you can do. Just turning your phone off is um, a very um, brute force way. But if you don't need your phone at the moment and you know you're not going to need it for hours, turn it off. Of course, we're very connected and we need to be um, in our networks at very vital times. But for times where I don't need my device and I know that I can just go ghost or go dark for a little while, I just turn everything off. Because not only does it help your battery life, but it also takes away that factor of someone, if someone is doing attack, everything just got cut off, you know? Um, overall, that, that that's what, I'll just hand it over after that for people who have Q and A and questions like that. Um, but that's overall my, um, my approach to security and my approach to encryption and being able to actually uh, take inventory and storage of what you have and tracking smartphones and tracking what exactly manufacturers and companies are doing with these smartphones and with our data overall. Great, Alexis and Edeleen, um, thank you. And let's, um, we've got a couple of questions. Alexis, thank you for catching one that came in through the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, there's also one um, in the chat, if I have a flip phone that's not a smartphone, can I still encrypt my texts? Uh, um, I went over this a very like briefly with like, I guess more analog phones. Um, so for phones that aren't smart or not considered smartphones, what you can do with your texts, if you don't, if you can't get an application like Signal is go into your um, settings um, and being able to track whether or not like, you know, like what so phone service provider is very important here. 
Um, so Sprint, Verizon, you can't necessarily block on a regular, I guess, flip phone the, and encrypt that traffic. But what you can do is um, if, if your phones are being in use for some sort of activist work, you can take that phone number and just kind of completely um, share it with your very trusted network. If it's more of a personal phone, it's harder to encrypt if you don't have um, applications you can put on the phone. There is, um, I'll, put, I'll search for it as we go over this presentation and look for it. Um, but overall, I do know that there is encryption capabilities for um, flip phones because they normally put Wi-Fi um, from, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there are Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities on flip phones. Um, it's just not robust application markets to put on the phone. So what you can do is encrypt your Wi-Fi traffic, encrypt your um, um, Bluetooth, um, or turn off your Bluetooth, turn off any sensors you don't need on these flip phones. Um, Wi-Fi, if you don't plan to use Wi-Fi, I would say turn it off on your flip phone. But as far as encrypting the text themselves, it's a little tougher to do on flip phones. So I don't know an, um, I don't know an actual um, direct, I guess, a solution for that in particular. But I do know that if you can, just kind of take that number and only share it with a very trusted network um, is my best answer for that one. Great. Uh, we have a couple other questions. Um, uh, what is the promise that blockchain decentralized apps offer in this arena? Mm, that's a good question. So blockchain is very much so still being discussed in the security realm. Uh, blockchain is slower than most encryption uh, device um, um, tools out there right now, but with blockchain, um, I don't want to say it's decentralized in particular, but what, you, what we can do is have um, potential solutions where people communicate over blockchain, one-way messages or one-way needed um, networks. So the way for people who are not necessarily familiar with blockchain, uh, just think of it as a actual chain of little blocks here and there. Just think of it that way where you kind of send out a message and to a very specific block has an address and you send that message to that address and your um, address isn't necessarily human readable, but it got there and you get confirmation it got there. If you sent it to the wrong address, it's forever gone. And, and um, but it's still got labeled in this block of you know data in this database so there's still a message in there but it didn't get sent to the right place but if it got sent to the right place the person um with that address will receive it and then there will be a ledger saying okay this was received this was sent we don't know who got it we don't know who sent it in particular that's the best case scenario with the blockchain so obviously that can provide some sort of solution possibly to messaging um, Right now, pretty good security or a pretty um, good privacy um, keys can, um, are definitely kind of solving that problem already. So I think with blockchain, um, it would have to answer a question or answer a, a solution that PGP can provide, like being faster. Um, blockchain is definitely not faster than PGP right now, but if it becomes faster, I think people will consider um, using blockchain oriented apps. And it's also going to have to, um, I guess, separate itself from the cryptocurrency narrative because right now cryptocurrency is all the rage and a lot of blockchain networks can get clogged with these cryptocurrency um, uh, transactions. So being able to have a blockchain also that is separate from uh, a blockchain database separate from the cryptocurrency database because right now Ethereum, you can create Ethereum apps off the blockchain, but Ethereum is also support Ethereum cryptocurrency. Um, but we also had an incident where somebody made a random app called CryptoKitties and it blocked up the Ethereum blockchain network. So if they can separate those two things and separate those two technologies, that's when blockchain can come in and possibly be a better solution than PGP, PGP keys. 
Okay, so I know there's more questions and um, I don't want to run too much into Praveen's time. Right. Uh, we, just real fast. So the true value of incognito, I mean, if you're working in Google Chrome, it doesn't really work. It works like if you want to look at your own history, you won't see your history. But if you don't want your history to come up or to, for you to be tracked, go to DuckDuckGo or go use Tor. Those are the best things. Um, and then for safety numbers, when it comes to signal, um, the safety numbers are really just aligned to your specific contact. And it's just making sure, um, just like if you have a unique number, it's saying this unique person, this number is assigned to, to your contact. Um, so that's why it's really important for you to um, get that number, that safety number verified. Um, and every time you update your phone or your software, it's really important to once again to, um, to verify that safety number because there's other gadgets that can basically mimic that safety number if you didn't verify it and they could have a conversation. So real fast, we'll pass it on to Praveen. We're going to be here talking and learning with you all. So definitely thank you and stay, keep, keep tuned in. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks y'all. Um, actually, you know, bef well, okay, I'll go ahead and just do an intro for myself. So uh, I work at an organization called Equality Labs. I'm the technology director. Uh, and we work on um, basically security issues uh, for marginalized communities throughout the world. Uh, we work uh, with uh, immigrant communities, uh, Muslim South Asian communities, uh, uh, black and brown folks, and just generally like, uh, yeah, just uh, anybody that uh, needs help. Um, so uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we've, we try to like make our uh, curriculum, you know, really centered towards uh, towards people's needs. Um, and I'm gonna be just gonna touch on, um, I think uh, uh, Edelin and Alexis did a great job on talking about uh, sort of government surveillance. Uh, what I'm gonna be kind of talking about more is uh, surveillance by, I guess, like more private actors like trolls uh, and other unsavory characters on the internet uh, that may be causing harassment and stuff. Um, I do actually want to, if it's okay, just address one of the questions uh, in from the audience because I think it, it is a good question that's important, which is the explaining the safety numbers and reset sec, uh, secure sec, uh, session on Signal. Um, so, what that is briefly is that when you're communicating over Signal, uh, the line is encrypted, but uh, it's it can be vulnerable to what's called a, a man in the middle attack, and what that means is is that somebody may be hacking uh, the connection in the middle and pretending to be somebody else. Uh, and that's a common problem uh, in sort of these encrypted networks is you need to be able to like, authenticate and prove that who you're talking to is really who you're talking to. So what the safety number is, is that uh, when you're using Signal, you can go ahead and uh, basically confirm that the safety number is the same uh, for both parties on both sides. Uh, and what that means is that uh, if they are the same, then you know that uh, you've established uh, authenticated uh, a line basically between the person that you're talking to and, and you know that that person uh, is the person you're talking to and that there's nobody in the middle listening basically. So uh, most people don't use the safety numbers, but if you are in a very high security situation, like I highly recommend that you uh, um, verify those safety numbers before continuing conversation. So, um, so with that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of trolling and doxing and harassment. Uh, this is issues that are pervasive right now in the world. Uh, and I'm going to actually um, do a little screen share here. So uh, trolling and doxing uh, has been happening uh, you know, since, uh, like, I think it really started um, taking off during what's called Gamergate, basically. Uh, and Gamergate is sort of a, uh, was in a, a series of events in the uh, online gaming community world uh, where people like women were uh, kind of uh, stalked and systematically harassed. Uh, and uh, the techniques that were used uh, 
during this time period uh, in the video game culture sort of set the set the groundwork for basically uh, how doxing and harassment sort of works uh, by mobs uh, globally right now. And so uh, the in in sort of the video game circles, they established uh, uh, basically groups that would communicate over chat. Uh, they would have shared um, sort of documents and pads that they would work with, uh, and then they would like. Uh, do mob doxing. So basically you would have teams of people that would go out and like try to identify uh, uh, what would be, you know, personal information about uh, people uh, in order to, uh, you know, harass them. Um, so, uh, so for folks that aren't familiar with doxing, by the way, so doxing is, uh, is the act of basically going out on the internet and um, grabbing all your personal data. And what uh, that, that data could look like uh, your address, your phone number, your family's addresses, uh, you know, your family's phone numbers, uh, grabbing everything from social media, um, getting that all into like one big compiled document. And uh, from there, uh, harassment uh, strategies start. And so some of the harassment uh, can look like, uh, I don't know, it could be as something like ordering pizza to your house, uh, calling bomb threats to your house. Uh, and, uh, you know, people get really creative with it. So, um, so I'm going to kind of show you a little bit of uh, how uh, sort of the doxing tools work and some of the ecosystems around it. So, uh, you know, and actually I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to ask for brave audience volunteers. Uh, and actually if folks in the panel too want to uh, volunteer as well. Um, basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to share my screen and do some searches on people to see what sort of information is out there on the, on the internet. Uh, so, is there anybody that would like to? <laughs> oh my gosh, so many hands are going up. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, I'm going just with the first three that okay. popped up. I apologize. Just, uh, I'm gonna go with um, um, Judith. Um, I'm gonna. You're unmuted. I'm gonna see if I can uh, bring you up on webcam too. Um, and Lauren. I'm gonna see if I can bring you up. And I'm gonna try to bring up Edward too. Can we hear you all? Anyone wanna jump in just with your voice first? Lauren, let's see, can we hear you? Let's see. Let's see, should be letting you all speak. Oh, here we go, I need to do a second thing. Okay, Judith and Lauren. Okay, Lauren, I'm gonna unmute, unmute. you. Sorry about that. It's all right. Judith Hi, Lauren. Lauren, we should be able to hear both of you. And then I'm gonna see if I can uh, go get one more person. Praveen, while you start, this is very exciting. Okay, <laughs> now, <clears throat> can you all uh, see my shared screen here? Yes. Great. So I'm going to a website called Spokio, and what Spokio is, is it's a data broker, and this is one of hundreds out there. And these data brokers, uh, they monitor you, uh, and they look at your utility bills, they <laughs> look at uh, your addresses, they, they capture, they actually buy information from, uh, from a variety of sources, uh, and this isn't even like Facebook, this is just your data trail that you leave behind in the physical world, <clears throat> and they collect uh, dossiers on you, basically, and sell that. So Lauren, what I'm going to ask you is uh, just, uh, would you give me your full name and how you spell it? L-A-U-R-E-N R-E-G-A-N R-E-G-A-N, like that? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just do a search. And uh, can you tell me which state you're in? Oregon. Oregon, great. Scroll down and we'll look at Oregon. Okay. And Lauren, do, sorry, do, Lauren, do you want us to bring up your webcam or would you rather just do voice? <clears throat> voice is fine. Okay. And uh, Lauren, so which city do you live in? I live in Eugene. Eugene, okay, so. Oh, really? Okay, so uh, is this you here? The... Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so let's take a look here. Uh, so is, there, is it maybe in so, uh, so just basically through a public search, uh, we have like a photo 
Uh, it looks like, is this your landline here? That's and your house office. address? It's your house? No, that's uh, office. Oh, that's your office, okay. Old office, I should say. Okay, okay, it's a little out of date, I guess, right? Um, okay, so that's good, that's great. Uh, but, um, <laughs> All the way back and, to uh, are these, are these your relatives though? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so when folks are, and here's your LinkedIn profile, so this can get pretty, um, oh, great, and your kind of organizational history. Eventually, but it's not urgent. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, Lauren, so, uh, um, so we can see here that, uh, you know, um, just through a casual web search, uh, we can actually find out a considerable bit amount uh, on you. And so, uh, the Spokio that I'm using is actually a $20 paid account. So, uh, so some of this stuff you won't see on the free version, but the free version does be your family members and your address. Um, and uh, I know we have another volunteer too. Uh, maybe we could get the next person um, and I'll do another, just search, sample search. You bet, Praveen. We have um, Judith, Mara, and Maya, and I'm gonna um, bring you up in that <coughs> order. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to, I've been muting people in between just to cut down on background noise. So Judith, let's see if we can hear you now. Judith? Judith, can you hear us? Okay, maybe we'll come back to Judith. Okay. Let's try, um, let's try Mara. Hi, Hi. am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, cool. Okay, I'm in the Chicago area. Okay. So, I also have a question at the at the end about uh, doxing and um, some of the things that might be done. I'm a national organizer, and I'm just curious about a couple weird things that happen. Sure. Um, so, Mara, uh, can you give me your full name? And I'm going to run you through another one of these. Uh, sure. Um, good. It's Mara M A R A Cohen C O H E N. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, let's see here in Chicago, it's Illinois. It's actually Skokie, S-K-O-K-I-E. That might that get more hits. Oh, okay, S-K-O-K-I-E, like that? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's take a look. I can't see very well, but I believe it's the second one down. Oh, uh, okay, you know what, let me go back to the Cohen. I think I just messed up the uh, screen, maybe. Here we go. So that's a dapple picture. It's me. I couldn't yeah, see it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So uh, so we can see here uh, again that uh, this is a free public search. Uh, you're a regional organizer at Move On. Uh, no. Has your no? I was a long yeah. time ago. Okay. Very much not anymore. <laughs> uh, again. Okay. Good. Good. Um, but this this is uh, and then uh, it looks like you uh, maybe have some family members. Yes. Yeah. So. I make sure they have pretty old information on me, I think. I'm interested to see this. Look yeah, yeah. So the there are a number of strategies. And, yeah. There's a number of strategies to try to mitigate some of this stuff. Uh, but uh, oftentimes folks that we work with uh, may be like getting in the media or they're, you know, for some reason there's getting a lot of attention drawn to them. And so mm -hmm. uh, we there's also methods to scrub and opt out of these uh, sites as well. So. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, Mara, did you say you had a question though? Yes. Um, is one of the things that can happen, I don't know if doxing is applicable to government um, annoying uh, and, and harassing people too, or if that's just a uh, a word for corporate and trolling and all that kind of thing, but is one of the things that can happen just random weird stuff with your computer and phone that tech support can't explain or help po you with? Possibly, just... yes, yes, okay. uh, possibly. And that, this is a segment I'll go into uh, just shortly. So um, let's see, okay, thank a few you. more minutes here, okay. So, um, so actually, I still, I will still need one more volunteer, but not uh, just in just a minute, if that's okay. Um, okay, that'll, be, to, that'll okay. be Maya. Sit tight, Maya. Great, great. So when we're talking about doxing, um, you know, I wanted to usually, uh, when I work with people, I show them the site called WeSearcher.org. Uh, but of course, it was just my luck today that this site uh, is actually down for maintenance. Uh, but what this site is, is a... Uh, um, 
it is, you know, actually, let me uh, switch my screen share here. And uh, one second. Uh, so uh, let's see here. Okay, so Researcher is a website, and what it is, it's a bounty website, and it, the bounties are for uh, left-leaning activists, basically, to identify them. So the site is is currently under maintenance. So I'm just going to actually just show you a screenshot of what it normally looks like. I don't know if you can see this, but basically, there's real dollar bounties. So uh, on this stuff, um, so we have. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, left activists, uh, you know, like this person uh, was in the DC protest. They had a $5,000 bounty uh, for his information and doxing. Uh, this person was also a DC $1,500 bounty. And uh, basically this site uh, is a systematic, uh, uh, systematically goes through and, and yeah, puts up bounties uh, for, uh, for people that they don't like. And um, they try to identify them and attempt to get prosecutions uh, or God knows what else. Um, so this is kind of like one of the sites I kind of show to kind of scare people. Um, the other site that I, uh, you know, kind of also show is that uh, there's a this site called KeyWiki and what KeyWiki is, is uh, it is a systematic uh, wiki database uh, that is being maintained uh, by the right wing, uh, and they are, uh, you know, made, uh, systematically going after activists throughout the U United States. So there's lots of people uh, in this wiki. Um, you can even go, and if you're curious about you or your friends, um, you can go and just search uh, to see if they have an entry. Um, but this is a privately maintained website, and they're trying to like uh, track connections uh, for all sorts of people. And, and I won't actually put any names of the people that I know right now, just just to protect them, but uh, if you are curious, I do recommend that you go to the site and do some searching. Uh, and and for all these sites, uh, uh, I think uh, Alexis talked about using a VPN, and I highly encourage that too because uh, you know they're tracking your IP addresses, uh, and if you have a VPN, it's uh, it's good to use. Um, I'm gonna do uh, okay. So I'm sorry, we had a uh, one more volunteer, right? That's right. Let me see if we can bring in Maya. Hello. Hi. Hi, Maya. So, Maya, um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to ask you for your email address, and I'm going to check to see if your password has been floating out there somewhere. Oh, great. <laughs> My email address is... So, the site is called Have I Been Pwned, and what it is is it's actually a pretty good service that is tracking uh, to see who, where your password has been breached. Um, so it looks like your breach, uh, you do actually have a breach from 2017. Uh, basically uh, this data, it's not gonna show you this data for this particular breach, but uh, there was this River City Media breach, uh, which has leaked email addresses, IP addresses, names, and physical addresses. Um, I'm just actually gonna go ahead and just search for myself, just to kind of show you, uh, there is, for all these breaches, there's actually a very active community that trades passwords, uh, and these passwords uh, are indexed in these files called uh, paste, basically. And uh, I'm just gonna show you, you know, for my own uh, breaches here, uh, just through the site that, uh, I don't know if I can find a good breach here. Um, uh, show you that, uh, you know, every time you see something in the media that, oh, this site's been breached, that site's been breached, uh, there's a very active uh, commercial ecosystem that, uh, you know, both trolls and hackers and also governments uh, will actually buy. So there's, uh, you know, people will buy a list of like 10,000 passwords for like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, for a hundred dollars. So um, I'm just trying to find one of these pages is open. Okay, so I'll just search for my personal email address in here. Uh, it's still loading. Okay, but so for example, so you can see all these email addresses. This is one of my old uh, passwords. I've changed it, but this is a good practice to always keep your passwords separate and keep them uh, rotated because you can see here that, uh, uh, you know, this is my email and your password. And, you know, you're probably on a list like this somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, it's good to use a password manager if you can uh, and to actively rotate out your passwords 
uh, you know, every few months. Um, and uh, so let's see, I think I'm running up on my time. Uh, let me just uh, go ahead and uh, I guess like stop there and I'll just see if there's any, uh, any questions. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, so what I'm seeing is, for some reason, my chat is breaking up. Okay, so, okay, lots of questions here. Okay, uh, so password managers, yeah. So uh, in terms of password managers, uh, I think the one that I, I personally like the best is uh, one password as, as far as a commercial manager goes. And one of the good things about them is that they're also signed up to these password breaches services. So it will actually alert you which accounts uh, are getting breached. Um, so that's a really useful service. And it costs about, I think, around $10 a month. But if you're doing high security work for an organization, that's a, that's a pretty good cost to absorb. Um, some people, like, you know, justifiably so, don't like giving their passwords out to anyone. Uh, and so there's a system called KeyPass, uh, which is uh, all passwords all stored on your hard drive and encrypted on your hard drive. And uh, that's a good solution for techie folks. Uh, but the thing you gotta keep in mind is, is that if you, you know, something happens to your hard drive or if you lose your master password, then you're really locked out of all your accounts. So you gotta have a disaster recovery plan uh, in place for that. Uh, and, you know, in other conversations that I've had, uh, some people don't use password managers. They just have uh, some sort of algorithm in their head uh, to create and generate passwords. And, and I think that's actually a pretty valid approach as well, um, if that's something that you can maintain and, you know, you can make sure that you can rotate out and keep the passwords fresh. Uh, that's also an approach to use as well. Um, and uh, let's see, another question here uh, is, uh, okay, VPN. So I mentioned VPNs while visiting key wiki. Uh, so uh, are there other precautions to take while visiting these sites or are these sites otherwise unsafe to visit? So yeah, um, in general, um, so I showed you Researcher and key wiki. There's other sites like 4chan and 8chan. Uh, and those sites uh, you can think of as like pretty much like active hate sites uh, where they plan what they call raids. Uh, so if you go to 4chan uh, and slash, uh, slash POL is the political board where uh, there's a very active uh, community that's looking at news and trying to dox people. Uh, going to those sites, uh, I definitely recommend uh, using either a VPN or a Tor browser. Um, and I think Alexis talks about Tor browser. Uh, Tor browser is uh, slower than a VPN, but in some ways it's also more secure in uh, hiding your identity. <clears throat> um, in terms of other precautions, uh, I think I think just for visiting the site, uh, that's that's fine. Tor Tor VPN should uh, should protect you. Um, and let me just check on time. I think I'm gonna have to pass it to Ken, right? Yeah, Praveen. I think that's the best thing right now. But we'll see if we can circle back. Um, these are really great questions coming in, and I appreciate all of the speakers um, who have been offering answers um, in the chat and in the questions and trying to get to everybody. Um, but yeah, if you want to introduce Ken, I think that would be great, and then we'll try to uh, get everybody back in for Q&A at the end after uh, some questions for Ken. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, actually, let me just, uh, one second. So yeah, so Ken, I'm really happy to introduce. He's a, he's a good friend. Uh, he's co-founder of the LAPD Stop Spying Coalition and the vice president of the National Lawyers Guild. Uh, he's been a nonprofit technologist for over 17 years. Uh, and he's currently the uh, IT director at the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles and a board member of uh, the National Technology Net uh, Network and uh, the Immigrant Defenders Law Center. So uh, Ken, uh, really happy to thank you. And Thanks, Praveen, and thanks, all. I think it's it's really nice to kind of follow up here because, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a building action when having these conversations about security. I think a lot of times it's very easy to get wrapped up in the tools. And I'm actually going to ask us to kind of go back to um, centering some other items when we're having these conversations about technology. So for me, I'm going to start off with a, a bucket of slides. So um, security notes. Um, Praveen covered who I am, but a big part of uh, this conversation about security is really about safety. And safety includes our mental health. 
So oftentimes when we're talking about security solutions, we have people, we create this like culture where people freak out, where it's like, oh, you need to like, blockchain will do this, or like, oh, like X, Y, and Z that. What you need to do is like build the best Rube Goldberg machine and that'll keep you safe. And the reality is that I'm, I'm a big fan of, if we kind of center this on people, then we can identify solutions that will actually stick. And uh, if a solution will stick, then we have a greater likelihood of actually creating a security culture. And, and it's a slow process, but I'm really glad that there are a lot of organizers on um, the um, call on the webinar today. Um, I think it's also important to lift the context. So at the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, one of the big things that, that we always, that keeps us grounded is realizing that when we're talking about police surveillance or even uh, private party surveillance, uh, this is nothing but a continuation of history. It's not this unique moment. We have to realize that for marginalized communities, particularly like non-cis, non-white communities, not cis male, non-white communities, surveillance has been just run of the mill. It's something that they're accustomed to and it's something that needs to be disrupted. Um, and I think particularly with the audience we have today, we have a lot of, we have a lot of folks from the um, environmental protection movement um, we have to think back to the days when surveillance was used aggressively in the 1990s and early 2000s to really disrupt some of the more radical, um, meaningful environmental protection work. So it's stuff that you all know. So I think that just because we're talking about the technology aspect of it, it's very dangerous to pretend that they're um, two distinct things. Um, and I think that so when, we, when we have these conversations, we're facing these really huge challenges. One of them is that our digital footprint is huge. So if we take a moment and we like look at our phones and we look at all the pictures that are on that phone and we're like, wow, if this was a photo album, each one of us would need like a personal archivist. We would need like tons of storage space, like physical storage space, photo albums, et cetera. And yet in the digital world, that's really invisibilized. So how do we kind of remind ourselves of the digital artifacts that we're leaving? I think there's also a challenge that technology is largely designed by non-activist white people who are trying to figure out how to get like venture capitalist money and all that other hot mess that makes the world horrible. Um, so there's very little technology designed for mission driven or social transformation. Um, um, groups, organizations, whatever um, iteration or, or formation you wanna call it. And that's, that's a huge challenge because the way that uh, we look at the world generally within this side of the house is we're not hoping to like monetize the 50 users who sign up for something. We're hoping to build relationships with them, et cetera, and to hopefully move the needle um, in a positive direction or in a more like just liberation oriented direction, hopefully. And so another factor that we're facing in, in movement driven work is that there aren't a lot of technologists in this world. Like more often than not, the technologists are parachuting into your world, telling you here are like some five solutions, go ahead and do X, Y, and Z without actually breaking bread with you and building it with you. And how do we kind of disrupt that as well? I think one of the challenges is that um, funders will sometimes be very hot and heavy about like, oh, we want to do a digital security training without realizing that a lot of this is about cultural shift. So if like, me and five of my homies decide to use um, X technology, we can create a community of practice and we can get better at it and that technology becomes normalized and it becomes part of how we do our work. Um, it's very, very important to me to see how some of the good practices we have in movement building can be translated or carried over into our use of technology. The final, I think, big challenge at a meta level is that this technology was really vast. And it's so fast that it, it, it requires a lot of, um, of a learning curve. It requires us being reflective and saying like, you know what, that technology that we spent two years rolling out is garbage and it's not doing X, Y, or Z. It's not keeping our people safe, et cetera. So at some point we have to realize, look, technology will never be the answer. The answer is always people power, the power of relationships really at the end of the day. So the key concepts that I'm really gonna dash through in the interest of time is a concept of practical security. So practical security, in a nutshell, it's stuff that we can expect people to do or practice. So like, let's say 
in, in my work, I'm lucky to work with, with the diversity of communities, but let's say if I'm talking to um, day laborers, um, particularly Spanish monolingual day laborers, I realize that whatever I'm asking them to do or suggesting or whatever we figure out is going to be like the next step, the actionable part. Actionable part. Um, within that, I have to ask them to do something that they can do. I'm not going to ask them to do key-based encryption because I'm setting myself up for failure and I'm also setting them up for frustration and that's not movement building. Um, I think the second piece is uh, data stewardship. So in our transactions with communities and with supporters and members, nowadays that often looks like data. Like once upon a time, it was like this amorphous sign-in sheet that people may transcribe and put in a box and put away or butcher paper. Gradually, all those um, organizing and movement building relationships have a digital manifestation. So the question is, how do we become good stewards of the data that people entrusted us with? Um, and we need to be responsible with that data because it's, relationships are really what a lot of this is about. Finally, the concept that we developed at the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition was how do we have these conversations with a framework of power, not paranoia? We're here to build power. We're not here to scare people. So we want to center the fight for justice. We want to recognize that even if you tell an organizer, hey, you signal, and that organizer is committed to using signal, but all the people they organize with are using feature phones, like not smartphones, so feature phones, or they're using like, hey, I'm not gonna install Signal because my phone is full and it's like five Android versions back, et cetera. We have to realize, okay, then what is the next tool that people will use? And so um, that's part of that as well. There's also the concept that yes, there is mass surveillance, and if surveillance is a mean of social control, it's a form of state violence, which it is, then doing mission-driven work in spite of the surveillance, it kind of is, makes surveillance irrelevant because I think that if you show the state and private actors who wanna undermine your work that you're gonna do it regardless, then that's actually a, a victory. I'm very cautious of folks who are like, well, the technology isn't gonna keep us safe, so we have to stop doing that work. I would caution that, just the same way that I would caution anyone at a meeting who's like, oh, the FBI has a file on me. I'm like, wow, that's not a badge of honor. That's potentially like carelessness to a certain degree of like being proud of the fact that, you know, you pose a risk to folks. Um, so let's go back to point one. So in networks, so I'm a, um, by training, a system administrator. So like computer networks, that type of exciting stuff. And so in a network um, diagram, and this extends to human networks as well, we're only safe as our weakest node. Um, so like, let's say when you're playing like, or when you're keeping secrets with your friends, a lot of us have friends who are like, oh, I can't tell them because as soon as I tell them, that's getting out. Similarly, in our security work, we realize, oh, this person has bad technology practices and we have to figure out how do we incorporate them into our work or exclude them from our work for the sake of um, security and safety. Um, I think that's very important and it's very difficult because if we are going to incorporate them, it means that we have to invest time in training people. It's really quite simple. Either we bring them along or we leave them behind and I'm a bigger fan of bringing people along rather than bringing, leaving people behind. Um, and so these small steps could be, you know, I'm going to help my homies set up two-factor authentication. They don't need to understand the math or the cryptography behind it. Well, math is cryptography, but, um, but yeah, all they need to know is like, oh, this really is like a safety net in case your password is compromised. Um, the second thing is white supremacy is super real in tech. So if you look at the people making money off of technology, the people who say that technology is the answer, um, a lot of them are hella white and a lot of them are really invested in oppressive power structures. So it is somewhat delusional to believe that our salvation will be in technology our salvation, assuming there is such a thing, is really within each other. And so within that, I think that there is an invitation here to start to consider the tools that we use, that whenever there's the possibility of using an open source tool, we should try to use an open source tool because not only is it developed with a community um, perspective and input, and even if that community is more largely white, et cetera, da, 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 it's substantially better than private tools. The other thing that I would also invite folks to do, especially with the um, penetration of Office 365 and G Suite, Google Suite for nonprofits, is to consider 
that those products actually have better privacy protections than free Gmail. So free Gmail and other free services, you're really the product. With G Suite and with Office 365, if you're using like the donated versions for nonprofits, there's a greater degree of protection and there's actually centralized administration, which I think are, are really good. And the movement needs to figure that out. Um, I think another thing is figuring out at what point we invite people or collaborate with people who are using tools which we may not feel affinity for, like let's say Facebook's WhatsApp with a lot of marginalized communities, especially um, folks who live like in uh, the Indian subcontinent, um, Latin America, et cetera. You can't take WhatsApp away from them because that's the only way they connect with their families, but you can tell them, hey, don't turn on the backup feature because then it's just sharing all of your data um, or creating a potential data hole. So once again, we're in it together. Um, one of the things that, that really challenges nonprofits is how we don't generally, and this is really for senior managers at nonprofits, we need to create the culture shift where we invest in staff training. And continuous training is part of that framework as well, because having people attend a one-off security presentation isn't going to change culture. It might actually raise more questions and create more harm than good. Um, it's also an opportunity to build relationships with folks. So successful trainings usually entail A, accessibility, but also giving an opportunity for people to build a community of practice. Uh, and the person in that photo is Buenaventura Deruti, and Deruti said, I believe, as I always have, in freedom, the freedom which rests on the sense of responsibility. I consider discipline indispensable, but it must be interdiscipline, motivated by a common purpose and a strong feeling of camaraderie. And so within that, I think if we translate that political statement to like technology operations, then we start to realize, wow, this is not just a technology decision, this is actually a decision of collective security. I'd also like to challenge that um, security, it's a huge process. It's a never ending process, it's a big cycle. It's not just use Tor, use Signal, high five, you're done. It's, yeah, those are really good tools, but also are they tools that kind of address the material reality of the folks that you're working with? And are they accessible tools is, is a very big part of it. Do they meet all the functional requirements? So all like the operational needs you need to get your work done. Um, and I think that gets also important within this framework to realize that there is no like, oh, I'm secure, I'm done. That's really, really a big myth. I think a lot of folks go through workshops, implement five steps, read an article on the intercept and say like, high five, I'm secure. But if we're securing with people, if we're communicating with folks who practice very weak um, technical security or operational security, then we are putting people at risk. So I think in terms of trends within, particularly within the nonprofit sector, it's like the sexy ones are denial of service and harassment like doxing, et cetera. But more often than not, a lot of vulnerabilities are because people don't do software patches or because people leave a password taped to a display or something along the lines. So it's like how, when we're doing security, do we kind of address the low hanging fruit and not get distracted by encrypt everything, et cetera? Because I think most, most data exposures, more than 60%, of data exposures are caused by staff action. So how do we train staff not to click on every link in every email that they get? That's probably a, a bigger return on investment than teaching people how to do um, private key encryption. Um, the other thing is that the engine room just uh, put out a report a couple of weeks ago um, where I really appreciate how they, in a nutshell, created this continuum of where organizations and groups live in terms of um, digital security, that they're the folks who are unaware. So they have like, you know what, we're really busy, we're not doing anything about it, highly exposed. Learning like, oh wow, I guess I gotta do something. And then mastering. I would offer that these are also cyclical phases because if we are like, let's say, I work at a civil rights organization. If we were to start to collect um, HIPAA related data, then that would completely change the game where we would be closer to an unaware environment rather than a learning or a mastering environment. So all these things change, all these things are fluid. So here's a really quick breakdown of some process um, points. 
have honest discussions with your comrades, your colleagues, whatever you want to call them, your friends, and identify um, what are the current practices we all engage in? What are the risks that those practices entail? So some people call it a risk assessment, some people call it a threat assessment. Call it whatever you will, but have some honest conversations about the role of technology and the place that data holds in your organization. Create a plan with review loops. So I think more often than not, these are seen as one-shot exercises. That's very dangerous. This has to be a highly iterative process. And, uh, and to realize that the material inequities of the world um, are very real, especially when we talk about technology. So like, let's say a civil rights organization with a larger budget will have an easier time implementing technology solutions than like, let's say, a small worker center network that you know, doesn't even have up-to-date computers. And so for them, maybe the goal is, let's have up-to-date computers. Let's not make, shoot this like, long goal of having security awareness training for everyone once a year. Go slow, understand what you're doing, um, or don't do it. I think like with, with technology, technology is one of those things that is not very forgiving. It's not very forgiving in the sense that the user experience has to be a good experience. So make sure that when you're rolling out technology, especially related to security to your users, that it's something that they are um, going to be able to process, that they're at a time to process, to not roll it out. Like let's say, if you all are gonna kick off a campaign, maybe the time to roll out new technology is three months before that campaign. So um, that's super important. This is who I am. You got some of that in the intro. Um, I don't know what else to tell you, and uh, that's what I have for you. I'm going to stop my screen share. I'm on back. All right. Thank you, Ken. Wow. Wonderful. Thank you, um, all the speakers, for your presentations. And um, and I um, I was going to try to do a little bit of a uh, ask some questions and get a roundtable going. There's one, just one question that I want to ask, and then I want to let the speakers go to any, any questions that they saw pop up that they'd like to speak to more. Um, I just want to ask about, um, uh, Alexis, this was something in your presentation. You talked about sniffing, and I'm just wondering if you can say when people are sniffing data. Can you tell us a little bit more about what, what that is? Sure. So. I said sniffing as in a more general sense. So um, I guess a good point to bring up about sniffing would be like the latest news about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. So um, with Google phones and Android phones in particular and the scandal behind Facebook, I've noticed over time that people are starting to finally sort of realize that, you know, data can be exposed with a lot of private companies and they're kind of using it in their own way. So if someone had asked something earlier about, you know, incognito, for instance, um, and being able to um, navigate with the data on your phone versus the traffic that's sent out there. So normally um, someone had mentioned, I can't remember it was Praveen, I think, that mentioned man in the middle attacks is a very common attack of what I mean by like sniffing out traffic and data or intercepting the data and, and impersonating um, the user or, or the service being um, fooled by who's coming in. So um, in terms of traffic and being able to look at the traffic coming in and out of something. So traffic, that could mean pretty much anything, not even just digital. So um, someone looking over your shoulder at your, you know, computer, um, shoulder surfing, it could be someone impersonating you, it could be somebody who's able to access your data in a way that you do not know about. Um, what is what I mean by sniffing in more digital sense, a lot of actors can come in. Um, app permissions, for example, is very important here uh, in terms of what, as it relates to with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, where a lot of Android phones are leaking data that um, with these companies and Facebook is sniffing a lot of data. And so a lot of people have come, you know, I try not to just garner paranoia so much as more so more awareness of what's going on um, with the data and traffic on your phones and applications. Um, some people willingly sniff or give out sniffing permissions and not really know. So I think one of those uh, main things would be logging into other accounts with other forms of social media. So a lot of um, services out there, they log in with Facebook, log in with Google, log in with, you know, um, LinkedIn or something like that. Uh, that's like willing 
app permission right there of being able to sniff through your data on this other platform because instead of just logging in with your email and whatever information you put on the platform now you can now that login that's interfaced with facebook or google can see your entire profile with google and your entire profile with facebook and now they have that extra set of data along with your email along with your username along with your password um sniffing can come in many ways so i think about just mostly with trafficking and like what's going out of your phone what's going out of your accounts and kind of being cognizant of app permissions there and being cognizant of how traffic is coming out of your devices and that's what i mean mainly by sniffing sniffing traffic um it can get more granular with security talk uh, especially with ip addresses and being able to see like what particular requests are coming from different services port scanning stuff like that but that's more i didn't want to get too much into that piece but that's more so people trying to actually specifically attack, I think, and be a particular agent in that way. Um, in more of a broad and general sense, I mean, just like the traffic that's going out of your accounts and out of your phone and or your laptop and in between different services. Great, thank you. Um, I um, want to give everybody a chance to um, uh, to talk a little bit about kind of pick up where um, what Ken was speaking to last about kind of creating the culture in your organization. You have all worked in different organizations and um, I'm interested to hear um, any um, pieces of advice you have to the audience about um, about that piece about getting people adopting things about um, creating protocols and just a quick note so I don't forget. Yes, I will assemble all of the awesome <laughs> suggestions for different sites and tools um, and when we send the link uh, to the recording we'll send those also and I just wanted the people our brave volunteers to know that I will not include um, on the screen during the recording any of your personal information I'll just bring up the welcome slide or something else during that so they'll hear that that Praveen was seeing things like your address and phone number but that won't show up okay just a couple quick notes in case anybody was worried and then um, yeah a little more um, conversation about creating the culture within your movements and organizations I think would be terrific anyone want to jump uh, in? sure <laughs> <laughs> so I mean in terms of security core culture and adoption <clears throat> it's um, it's something that is really organizationally specific um, there's not really uh, like one way to go about it, you know, if you're uh, working with, um, I mean, if you're working, if your organization does a lot of work with like undocumented immigrants, uh, if you have folks that are crossing borders, like you're facing a whole set of different security challenges than if, you know, um, your organization maybe just, uh, I don't know, uh, just doing uh, community outreach, uh, I, or, you know, um, uh, or you know, like if you're uh, if you're if you have somebody that uh, again is is very uh, if your organization have folks that are very visible um, in the public sphere, then that uh, presents a completely different set of security challenges. Uh, and so a lot of this is like overlapping, uh, and then a lot of it is like I think uh, uh, the conversation has to really be like a back and forth because uh, you know uh, a new like people that are like very new in. Uh, security oftentimes they're like oh we have to take everything off of Google Drive we have to you know get to adopt all these tools and uh, you know these this tool adoption can get like really expensive and, and it kind of kills you know the organizational flow so it's really about like having a conversation assessing people's vulnerabilities and, and picking the right uh, right tools that I think will keep your workflow going and, and really uh, I know what other folks think <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll buy. So um, I've been working inside of nonprofits for over 20 years. And I think that's, that's a, uh, and usually as a lead technologist in nonprofits, and I also do contract work outside. I think for me, it's really, really important to figure out where management fits into this. So I think management, even in alleged um, horizontal organizations, um, if management identifies um, security, be it physical or digital as a priority, then that's where it all begins. Um, I, I think that more often than not, it's um, organizers or line staff or whatever we wanna call these roles are usually charged with like, hey, be more secure, but if it's really, hey, this is another piece of work that you need to handle, but without there being a good policy framework, 
then it's a recipe for disaster. I think a good example is some people will like roll out password managers because they heard password managers is the way to go. But if you're not using like, and that's one of the reasons why I recommended LastPass. LastPass actually has very good enterprise integration. So if we want to roll out LastPass to someone on our communications team, we can do that. And we know that all those credentials are still part of our organization as opposed to people having their own little buckets and silos that are super secure, but not really um, useful for organizational purposes. So I like to say that security, if we look at security in a usability continuum, it's kind of like a doorway. You can have a doorway without a door, super easy to go in and out, but then you can hang a curtain there, kind of creates a barrier. Then you put like a door that just swings open, then you add lock to the door. And before you know it, you have like one of those New York City doors that has like eight locks. No one knows which one is actually the one that's locking. And sometimes it's just unlocked and it's just for theater. So I think figuring those things out organizationally are super important. And the business process, like Praveen said, I think figuring out how do we implement security that doesn't res um, disrupt the organizational workflow, especially in mission-driven work. Because at the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, it took us, in spite of being embedded in this work, it took us three years before we had our first digital security training because we were committed to do this as an organizing piece of work, not as a look at us, we're kind of secure. Because once again, there's the illusion of what does that even mean? Um, to add a little bit there, I like um, Ken's point of like utilizing humans um, within the organization and because a lot of security talk is um, the weakest link is the human factor or the human error. And I think for organize, organizing, we all learned that, you know, humans are our greatest asset in terms of being able to properly organize. Uh, I think something to um, add here with organizing and especially with people, if you have constituents, is access. Um, especially with marginalized communities, technology just sort of happens to us depending on who exactly has access to create these technologies. Like now we're hearing all these buzzwords, blockchain, machine learning, AI, and a lot of these um, models, and AI is just decision-making, by the way, um, don't let these buzz buzzwords scare you. Um, AI is just decision-making at a high level. Um, machine learning is just a mass amount of models and data sets. Um, a lot of these things sort of happen to us because the people who create it have these large biases. Um, so I think uh, it's not so much a solace, but uh, a key point here is that the people who create these things aren't, they don't make perfect technology to perfectly attack us. And they don't make perfect technology to perfectly hand. We can always point them out. Um, at techactives.org, Italine likes to, um, you know, talk about counter surveillance in a way. And it's kind of like, keep tabs on the people keeping tabs on you. Um, and having this human factor of being able to be cognizant of what's going on with you, your organization, and all the, I think um, Ken mentioned earlier about like threat modeling or risk assessment or something like that, of uh, being cognizant. Um, just even if you personally write down like, okay, these are all the things that, you know, uh, with the, I have with accounts. These are all the things that I personally have with my credit cards. These are my bank accounts. And you kind of just write it down like, okay, these are all the things that I have that are personal and sensitive to me. And then you kind of talk about it at a, in a way, in a larger scale in the organization. Okay, these are the things that we have, and these are things that are important to us. So kind of going towards those points of being able to assess and evaluate what you have at your organization, what you consider sensitive at your organization, and kind of focusing around that first. Um, taking everybody off one tool and putting them on another can only do but so much if people aren't really cognizant of what's going on, what's happening. So having that proactive conversation and not a reactive conversation and, and not being so much, um, being scared of the buzzwords that come around with AI and machine learning, because the people who are creating this have very, very um, limited imagination. And I think an organizers have the, the biggest ima imagination for what society can look like um, and what this technology can do for us and how we can let make it use it for us and ourselves. So I think when we do that and kind of have that human assessment first and then kind of go over like, well, the people who are deploying these technologies um, have very one set mind tracks on when they deploy them. And when we catch that and be able to um, create a, um, a conversation for ourselves and, and see how we can kind of counter surveil or keep tabs on people who are keeping tabs on us, then I think that's when we can feel more empowered. And empowerment is very important in security because it's easy to freak people out. It's easy for people to get very paranoid because things have happened. 
for a long time. We saw it all the way back to COINTELPRO and before. Um, and I think seeing those, and they kind of use the same tactics, <laughs> like the same tactics, the same sort of um, things where in, in deployments of tactics and in some types of people and the same access points of vulnerabilities. And I think if we're just cognizant of that conversation when we have an organization, when we have tools and we have constituents that use tools, I think it's a very important conversation to keep having proactively rather than um, having a reactive sense about it, if that makes sense there, so. Hey, and I mean, Alexis and you already said uh, most of everything that should be stated. Um, one thing I just wanted to add is um, learning tech is super intimidating. So one culture should just be about being able to learn and to ask questions. And that is really, really healthy. A lot of times we um, leave it up to assumption. And we assume that people shouldn't know if I tell you we need to be secure, that you are going to know all these things. And a lot of communities that we work with get really intimidated and they make mistakes and then they don't want to have an open conversation about them because of how we're talking down to them because we have this new information. Um, so there's sometimes um, hierarchy there about information that we have and they don't have and that in itself can feel very oppressive um, so being able to have a good learning environment is i think is super critical for the culture of bringing security and um, talking about surveillance in your community great thank you all i just want to give any um any of our speakers a chance if there's a, a question that they saw um, on chat or the q a or um, anything else they wanted to speak to or a closing comment um, and just thank you all so much um, for everything you're sharing today and thank you to our audience um, for being here too yeah the only thing that i would add is um so in terms of like low tech solutions i'm a very big fan of um when, whenever possible, um, oh yeah, whenever possible, going with like a low tech solution. So like something like a Faraday bag, like better than turning off your phone, put your phone in a Faraday bag. Um, a lot easier to just like put it in a bag than like power it off, try to remove batteries or any of that hot mess. Just please, please, please. Let's try to identify like practical things. Faraday bag is like 10 bucks. Um, I would also add that um, it would be really good to build on one of the points that Alexis made is if folks were able to like just learn something basic like tethering your phone to your laptop because that will help you stay off public wi-fi in as much as possible avoid public wi-fi um and also one thing that we didn't talk about um too directly but praveen i think did a, a nice kind of point of insertion on that was the value of identity it's how do we make sure that when we're communicating with someone that it's actually the real person that we're communicating with i think that's one of the values of video um, in these things um, is that at least we're able to see who we're talking to. Um, and yeah, I, I think that those are things that, and those are very old school because video is kind of like a new, let's meet face to face. Um, and also in terms of tool recommendation, I think it's great that, um, that you folks as a host are using Zoom. Zoom has a nice end-to-end -end encryption option that people need, should turn off on if they're using Zoom. Um, but there's also Jitsi, which is open source. So there are a lot of like kind of like low lift tools. Um, Idalin, Praveen, they're like super, super big resources and, and comrades in this. And yeah, let's let's do this together. That's all I got. Anyone else want to jump in with a closing comment? A closing comment that I have is don't be afraid about tech and I read this comment talking about when techies try to explain shit like, yo, ask the tech person mad questions. If they don't know how to answer it's because they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Like we all in this liberation fight together. And when I learned how to read and write, that didn't mean I was going to be an author. It was so I can move and be able to be functional in society. And today we need to learn about tech and we need to know about digital security. 
And if you didn't go to school for that, you didn't go to school for that. And that's totally fine. If you don't know it, you don't know it. Um, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to hold us accountable as technologists. We're on the movement together. We need each other. We need to love and support and communicate. So final questions. That's my, my last feedback. Thank you all. Anyone else want to jump in? It's a pretty good note to end on, isn't it? Well, yeah, I do want to echo Italian what uh you know what Elin said is is that uh yeah just uh, you don't have to be a tech person to understand this stuff like it's not about uh you know people in the tech industry often like there's not they don't necessarily have like a fancy background you know it's really just about going in there and yeah like echo yeah asking questions and uh and you know you are the best expert for yourself and i guess to add to that piece for a closing comment um get to know your devices and your tools. Um, you don't necessarily need to be, you know, taking your laptop apart and digging through everything. Um, but knowing the components that come with all your devices over time can help a lot in terms of what needs to be fixed um, on a very practical level. Um, not just, you know, fixing your cracked screens, but also like, okay, what is a processor? What is a hard drive? Very little things that you can just take in once at a time. You don't have to do it all at once. This is an ongoing process. There's still parts of machines and stuff I, I don't know with laptops and you know cars and stuff like that. I've started integrating more technology. Um, overall, being able to get to know your tools and devices. You know, Android is a operating system, not a phone. Um, stuff like that, where you can start to get those little details in and sync them in. And just like one a day, or if you're more interested in learning, there's definitely open source courses like Coursera.com or edX.org or Udacity. Um, which is more, I guess, web development oriented. But overall, um, if you are interested in learning, there are a lot of free resources out there. Um, let, let's not let capitalism make it seem like all this technology and all this knowledge is just for them and people who can afford it. There is now free tools out there. I share free information all the time, especially on my Twitter. Um, I also um, share resources for um, local organization and meetup groups that talk about, you know, building your own ISPs and stuff like that, innocent internet service providers, making a mesh network. And, kind of, and you don't need to know everything when you come in a room. That's another point of this is knowing everything because we all don't know everything, but we can learn from each other. So that's what I'd like to close with. Great, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the panelists. And I look forward to getting this information to um, the audience members and um, yeah, let's let's take good care of our, ourselves and each other. And thank you all for giving us a lot of good uh, advice for how to do that. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.